Is this the dagger? Oh! Illegal substitution. Too many men on the field. Saskatchewan. Gizmo has a block in the sidelines. He has not stepped out. He may go all the way. He needs one block and he'll do it easily. Promise mess I wouldn't do this. McDavid stops up. What a move. Shoots. Scores. Hey, everybody, welcome to The Outsiders, powered by the McIntosh Group at REMAX River City. It's podcast 85 on season three. I'm Bryn Griffiths. He's Robin Brownlee. He is Bob Stoffer of the Oilers Radio Network and Oilers Now on 630 Chad. Bob, good morning. How are you? Bryn and Robin, how are you guys doing? I'm doing all right. We're doing great. You had a, matchup, you had a matchup to watch last night. What did you think of that game? against the Los Angeles Kings. You know what? The team started the season nine and one. And since then they're, uh, what are they? They're seven and six and six or seven and six. Yeah. Now I got to add that's hard at this time of day. They're <laughs> seven and six. So it was, I mean, you guys watched the game. It wasn't very pretty. There's really no other way to say it. LA came out. They were very tactical in their approach. The owners were slow out of the gate again, really for the third consecutive game. They didn't play well in the first two periods against Pittsburgh survive that game uh they didn't play well in seattle first two, two periods and had a great third period but it couldn't close the gap and last night weren't good early again um there's some reoccurring themes that are a little bit concerning and uh, i guess we'll have to see how they react and whether or not some health maybe helps them out a bit here i mean I, it's not an excuse every team in the league has injuries and I'm happy with where the team's at record-wise, but not happy with sort of a, a bit of a recency bias in terms of how they're playing. I mean, if, if you're watching it, you're an Oilers fan, you're, there are some things that are a little bit concerning. Yeah, I mean, Dave Tippett touched on it last night, Bob. Um, you know, the power play, among a couple of other uh, positive notes about the team, has sort of been mitigating or covering up some shortcomings elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> we know about the left side of that D, Nurse is back. But that they have been short. That'll have an impact. Like you say, you don't want to make excuses. But what do you see? I mean, coaches' game plan, they don't have to be rah, rah, okay, boys, let's go. Or at least I don't think they do. Um, these slow starts are a head scratcher for me. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is they're getting no productivity out of their bottom six forwards. Again, you know, we thought that that was the first five games of the year. Uh, you know, Derek Ryan scored against Calgary. Cassian got a couple goals and Fogel got a couple goals. Yep. Well, Fogel hasn't scored since. Derek Ryan, at this stage in his career, he's 34 years of age. He's he's a far flying center. Like he's being paid like a, he's a $1.25 million cap hit. I did not envision him being minus 13. Um, and the unfortunately, the secondary analytics numbers are not. You know, they're, they're not very pretty right now for him right now. He's done a real good – he's been pretty effective on the PK with Colton Sevier. But Edmonton, if you're not getting much juice out of your bottom six, and they'll get Shore back this week, maybe as early as tomorrow, uh, it's difficult at times to sustain things shift after shift after shift. So I don't think this – I let's rephrase that. This is not going to be the bottom six we're going to see the team finish the season with. You know, there's going to be – so short, short, they like short, short played against Winnipeg in the triple overtime game. You know, he was one of the nine forwards that saw a regular shift. He's going to play, you know, what happens with Archibald? He's got myocarditis. Is it a, a bad case of it or, or a light case of it where he might actually be able to play? Um, Dylan Holloway obviously is going to be a factor. The players are quite, you know, this guy can, he's got a dimension and, and, so he, you know, he goes down maybe middle of January once he's fully recovered from the wrist surgery. Can he be up for the playoff drive? Possibly. And then I think they need to make a trade. I think they need to add another. And, you know, they might need to go get two UFA pending type forwards that could play in the bottom six. And these are not guys that you're giving up a first round draft choice for. These are players that you're giving up a fourth or fifth round pick for. So, um, that's for me, that's one of the areas is I'll be honest. I thought based on, you know, Fogel being acquired, possibly playing with Cassian, 
that the others, those guys could be useful sort of middle, you know, uh, third line guys that hasn't come to fruition. Um, and I agree with Dave Tippett, the specialty. I mean, the penalty killing until last night, guys, was second in the NHL. Yeah. They, they gave up three on that McDavid major penalty. And it was a major. Yep. Uh, we've seen Connor get hit like that. I recall Hampus Lindholm belting McDavid in the corner in, in Anaheim. And there, there was no penalty on the play. And it's the exact same play. In fact, it was worse because it was further away from the boards. And McDavid was going in at a, a faster speed. Um, but it was, a, it was a major penalty. And, and so they got lit up for three there. You know, it's funny. We're sitting there picking apart a team at 16 and seven. I know, but I think, but I think everybody, you guys, you guys know the market. People are smart enough to see, you know, yeah, but guy was sitting there at 16 and five going, yeah, but I, I don't like aspects of the team. So for me, one of the areas was, de- was, was, was bottom six. I thought there'd be more push there. And, uh, you know, I like what Hyman's brought. Obviously McDavid and dry settle have been terrific. Pull Yarby's, become a pretty useful player. I think Yamamoto would like a little bit more offense. But last night, collectively against L.A., it was everybody. I mean, you guys watched the game. They didn't have much going from anybody right from the get-go. Two players concerning me at this point, Zach Cassian and uh, Yamamoto. Uh, I just, they've got to get, and, and you know, and I hate to say this, I'd like to see a little more, a, a few more goals coming from Ryan Nugent Hopkins as well. They've got to find a way to get some other goals other than the, the two big guys. But I don't know. Your thoughts on guys like that, Bob? Well, Cassian has been maddeningly inconsistent this year. Yeah. And, you know, for the Cassian detractors out there, they'll say this has been a two-and-a-half-year process with him. You know, you, you know since, he got, since he got the contract extension, um, I think the game is played differently now than even three or four years ago. And Zach said maybe a different place in his life. I think he decides as an example, like people, you know, people think he should be out there fighting every game. That's just not practical in today's NHL. Yeah. But it doesn't mean he can't run around, you know, and, uh, and get involved physically. I think that's part of the reason actually Dave Tippett put Benson with Cassidy last night was that, you know, Benson's desperate to stay in the league and getting outside of his comfort zone. And, and so, uh, yeah, I like a lot. I like more of Cassian. I'd like more goals out of Nugent Hopkins, and I'd like Yamamoto to have a shooter's mentality. And um, it's interesting what's happened to Yamamoto here. I mean, he had such a tremendous finish to the nineteen twenty season, twenty six games and or twenty six points in twenty seven games in the recall. Yeah, hasn't got close to being that player uh, over the last year plus. When when you look at Kyler Bob. Um, are you seeing something different from him? I mean, his size has always been his size. He's played around it. He's used his head uh, to save steps, uh, to to get where the action is without getting bowled over. I don't see him uh, chasing and retrieving pucks like he was when he was better. How about you? Yeah, he, well, he's not. I mean, that's... But he worked in the off season. If you recall, in the 2019 off season, he had he had a, a, like a I think he had a wrist challenge that had kept him out of the start of training camp, yeah. and uh, and then they sent him down. But he worked on first step quickness because that's how he was going to win puck battles. Is he was going to out quick guys. And I recall we were in Detroit at the end of October, and I watched Detroit's morning skate and Edmonton's morning skate. And I was like, uh-oh. I mean, this is when the Oilers had, you know, Patrick Russell was in the lineup and Kara was in the, Kara was on the second line with Nugent Hopkins in that game. And I, I just, I remember saying to our guys, like, we're slower than Detroit and Detroit's not a very good team. Yeah. And the Oilers ended up losing that game. And, and that was the year Edmonton started the year 5-0. and oh. I mean, they started this year 9-1. and 9-1 yeah. and one's 9-1. and one. That's why they're at 16-7 and seven right now is because they started the year 9-1. and one. Um but Yamamoto down in the minors for the first five games that year was the best player in the AHL. And it was because he was quick on pucks. Part of, for me, part of the challenge for him is that he hasn't had a shooter's mentality. When you're playing, put it this way, like those guys, Nugent Hopkins and Yamamoto are playing with with Leon Dreisaitl most nights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Dreisaitl's leading the NHL in scoring. And, and, and those guys have seven combined goals. Like you need more product. Like if you look at Hyman and Paul Yarby playing with McDavid, the numbers are there. You know what I mean? Like even, and, and Hyman won seven games without scoring and Paul Yarby won eight. 
but they need more productivity for sure from uh, from Nugent Hopkins and Yamamoto. It's going to be an interesting one with Yamamoto. Just you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see where that goes with the player because uh, there could be another option. Uh, and, and you know, for next season, Xavier Borgo is a similar. You know, he's having a great year. He's probably a little bit better finisher. He's yeah. leading the Quebec League in scoring right now. Um, I, I'm going to be. I, I wonder about a team like Seattle and that market. Uh, you know, Yamamoto's from the state of Washington, uh, and Seattle. Seattle has the type of pieces Edmonton could use to improve their third line. So. I, I, there's just something in the back of my mind. I mean, they got Yarn Croak as an example that Ken Holland drafted that for six years has scored 10 to, I don't know, 16, 17 goals, right? He's gotten off to a slow start there. Appleton's gotten off to a slow start there. And so there's lots of teams looking at Appleton who's represented by Rich Winner. Now the thing is Rich wants Appleton paid in his next contract. Sure. Partially based on what he did last year in Winnipeg. You guys saw Appleton in the playoffs. He was a pretty effective player for them. Like he's, unquestionably a good top nine forward. I, I, I don't have the stats in front of me here, but I, just and staying with Yamamoto for a minute, the one thing that has been aggravating is he takes so many offensive zone penalties. And when you're taking those penalties, you start second-guessing going in as hard as you do to go after that puck on a four-check. And I wonder if that's really started to get in the brain a little bit in terms of how he aggressively goes after that puck, Bob. Well, he get, the thing is, he doesn't. He's not drawing the same amount of penalties that he was two years ago either. And for me, that's. I wonder if it's quickness. I wonder if there's just a little. Like maybe he tried to work on his core strength and get stronger. Yeah. And for him, it's all about the quickness. Or, or maybe guys are getting used to him. But I mean, Brent, him, Yamamoto, and Benson have taken a lot of offensive zone. Ironically, Benson's haven't cost the team that much. I've felt. Um, and Benson, Benson's trying to. He's just desperate to stay in the league. So mm-hmm. um, it's no, I mean, you know, we haven't even, we, we haven't talked about the defense. And part of the reason is I look at the defense given who's out. Yes. You know, no, no nurse, no Keith, no CC. In my opinion, they held up relatively well. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, they did okay. And those guys were all organic solutions. They don't have any organic solutions at forward other than Holloway getting healthy here for this season. Like, you know, Lavoie is struggling down in the minors right now. He is not an option for a recall. They don't have a lot of form. They're going to have a bunch of guys next year. Like, you know, logic dictates that, you know, Borgo is a late birthday. If he's not in the NHL, he's going to be in the AHL next season. Um, Tyler Tulio is going to be in the American Hockey League next season. Carter Savoy probably one more year at Denver. So they're going to, but they are going to have, uh, you know, more forward prospects kind of down there. I mean, so, it's uh, it's an interesting one with the forwards because we're talking about a team that went into last night's game third in the NHL in goals, but first in the league of the power play, which it's their even strength play that's obviously the concern at this point. I know you guys have both picked up on that. Bob, uh, I don't know these young players like I once did because I'm not I'm not around, but I look at a guy like uh, Nima Linen, and because he's older, he's 23. To me, he looks like a guy who could be an everyday player uh, next season. Um, now, only seen him for a little bit. Maybe I'm getting carried away, but he's big. He like he likes to bang, obviously, um, and that's a pretty good combination if you can move your feet. He doesn't appear to be behind the play. What's your take on on Nima Linen? Yeah, I, I, I agree with your assertion. Um, who says he has to wait until next season? Oh, well. Okay, and I'll, I'll, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, Nurse is going to play 25 minutes a game on yeah. the left side. When Keith comes back, and he might be another week away, but he's going to play 20 minutes a game. That's 45 minutes. You know, like they're playing Cuckoo like 10 to 12 minutes. They're playing um, Russell like 12 to 14 minutes when he was in there. If they've got a guy with a different dimension, an actual dimension, which is what Nima Linen has – Nima Leinen is unlike any other defenseman in the Oilers organization. I mean, they got a lot of depth defensemen coming. Uh, they got several guys like Broberg in, in a couple of years from now, Broberg's going to like, we know Broberg's going to be on the team. He, you know, when, when the team gets healthy on defense, Broberg's probably going back down because he's going to need to play 22, 23 minutes a game. Nima Leinen has an outside chance to stay because of the very thing you've talked about. And 
it just, it gives Edmonton a little bit, you know, they need that. And I'll take it one step further. I found the comments of Alan Walsh to be a little bit interesting last night about Lagaston. Um, okay, now stop there for a second because I got to ask because I never saw the tweet. It got deleted so quickly. Can you kind of paraphrase well, a little bit? Basically, second guess that Lagaston wasn't told that he was a, a scratch before last night's game. Did it get tweeted? I saw it this morning, Brent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, in a meritocracy, which hockey is, if you based it on who started the season better in the minors between Nima Linen and, and Lagason, Nima Linen was outplaying Lagason the start of the year. So, yeah. uh, William Lagason's a depth defenseman. He's sort of a seven, eight, nine guy, right? But he doesn't have quite the same games, and he's not six foot five, and he doesn't skate through guys when he hits them. So, and unfortunately, and, I, and that said, Lagason's been fine since he's been up. He's been fine. And I, but I do, I, I'm with you, Robin. I think Nima Linen's an intriguing guy that has opened up some eyes. Yeah. I think he'd be helped if, and I'm led to believe that he probably realized, like my, my guess is he's in Edmonton by the middle of July in the off season and spending like two months with Chad Drummond and the guys here. They got to work on his first step quickness, a little bit on his puck moving, but he has the other dimensions that make him almost the perfect third pair. Like everybody's like, well, the owner's got to trade for Ben Sherratt or trade for Carson Suse. Well, what if you got a guy like that in your own organization, $800,000 that you can play, especially given that you have Nurse and Keith playing ahead of him in the top two spots. It's almost the perfect fit. So very astute with you, Robin. I think there's something there with the player. And uh, I think it's something to monitor here once the D gets a little bit more healthy. Here, Bob, I don't know what you, what you want to say or what you can say, uh, but I, I don't have a relationship with Alan Walsh, and I don't need one at this point. I find it odd that ra- that rather than pick up the telephone yeah. uh, and call Dave Tippett and say, Dave, what's what's going on with my guy? What can we do? Is there something I don't know about? The, the Twitter thing, I mean, come on, man. You got to be unbelievably naive to think that's the way to go. I mean, this was the same guy who did the draw the ran the drawing of the sword through Mark Andre Fleury last year. You're not getting any way using vinegar instead of honey. Are you? Why does Jerry Johansson get as good a deal as Robin as he does for his clients? Yep. Cause he's he reasonable. Wins, he, he wins every deal and he's easy to get along with. Yeah. Now I will say this. I think Alan's a really smart guy. Okay. I've had multiple conversations with him. I don't necessarily like the Mark Andre Fleury thing with Robin Lehner. Like to me, rock Mark Andre Fleury was, was a part of that culture in Vegas. Like I was a little surprised how that all shook down. And I think that's part of the reason why Vegas might be vulnerable. Like the orders have gone in there and Miko Koskinen's outplayed Laner twice this year. Yep. Yep. Something else to focus in. Edmonton seems to have found ways to beat in the better teams this year. And it had drop offs against maybe teams that they thought they were better than. They've lost to Buffalo. They've lost to Detroit. They've lost to Los Angeles. They lost to Seattle and Seattle. Like, you know, there's a little bit of a trend here. Uh, that said, they probably shouldn't have beaten Pittsburgh, but they did. So, I, you know, he's entitled to his, uh, you know, I, I, he's entitled to his opinion. I do think Alan's a pretty smart guy. I've talked to him, I don't know, six to ten times in the last couple of years, a couple times about Lagason. By the way, Lagason did clear waivers. Okay. It's food for thought, right? Yep. Like that's, yeah, you're right. Other teams could have picked him up. They didn't. So that tells you something, doesn't it? Yep. You know what I find absolutely astounding is we've been talking now for 19 minutes, and we have not, and this would not have been the case last year, Goaltending has not been brought up once by any of the three of us here. And, uh, I, like, to me, I, there's a lot of other little areas to pick at. Last year, it just seemed like goaltending was the one. But, Bob, your thoughts on, on what we've seen here? I know there have been some weird goals at weird times. However, it just doesn't seem to be as glaring this season, and I'm trying to figure out why that is. Your thoughts? Well, you know, last year the team finished uh, seventh in the league in save percentage, and they headed into last night's game seventh in the league. And so I just looked it up: seventh in the league in save percentage. That that to me says it all. I mean, they don't have Mike Smith. Yeah, they, you know, they've gone with Koskinen and Skinner for the last twenty games here, and their record is sixteen and seven. So, 
maybe they're lucky to be 16 and seven, but when you factor in that, they have, that's, that's, let me pose the question differently to you. Okay. It's the start of the season, Bryn. Edmonton's not going to have Mike Smith for 20 of the first 23 games. Uh, they're going to lose all three left shot D for a five game run. Okay. Yeah. And, and their bottom six forwards are, are going to take a bit of an analytics beating. What would you say their record would be? <laughs> well, it certainly wouldn't be what it is now. Right. I, so I, I just, I think the goaltending like, has not been the issue, quite frankly, yeah, for me. It, like, Koskinen's always been a good 1B goaltender. Yeah. Like, right now, you can make an argument, neither of these guys has proven to be good enough to win in the playoffs. And I'd make the, I'd make the argument the Oilers haven't had enough depth to win in the playoffs. How do you, you look back to the Winnipeg series, and they led that series for 60 minutes, and Winnipeg led it for 20, and Winnipeg swept them. And yeah. Winnipeg wins three over. Connor Hellebuck had a 950 save percentage. Yeah, right there. Then he turned around against Montreal and had an 860 save percentage, and they lost. Like, Winnipeg's an emotional team, but there were some things that kind of conspired against Edmonton to at least not get a win in that series, one of which is that the best player in the world couldn't draw a power play. And there were multiple times, especially in the overtimes, when you could make an argument there should have been some calls, and Edmonton's a team that gets penalized by refs putting the whistles away in the playoffs, Mm -hmm. which is why you have to continue to build out your forward groups so you have a better chance to roll four lines over come playoff time. Uh, Goaltending, you know, they're on a two-game losing streak, and Skinner would tell you he should have been better against Seattle, and Miko would tell you he should have had the second goal last night. It's a Mm -hmm. 1-1 game. It's a different game, right? So, uh, but... You guys know the game. I'm with you. Goaltending hasn't been an issue so far. Bob, uh, Skinner, he's better than I thought he would be based on his one start last year, even though he won. Uh, it wasn't. He didn't look particularly good. He's talked about resetting his stance and some things about maybe the way he tracks the puck. Mike Smith will be back next year on, on the deal he's got, but does Stuart Skinner have a chance to at least be – half the tandem, or maybe even the starter next year? I mean, I, I don't think, I, I think the starter might be a reach. Uh, I think what needs to happen, I think the hope is Mike Smith can come back before Christmas. That's the hope. He's back, you know, skating and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, Whew. For sure. For sure, Skinner is a like. I think Stewart's got to go back to the American Hockey League and start every game, right? Like, just he starts three quarters of the game. So let's let's just say, for the sake of argument, they got fifty games left when he goes. Down. Let's say he gets forty games left when he yeah. goes down. He's got to start thirty of them and get a ton of work and get used to playing all the time where he's the guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it'd be a little bit of a reach to think that he could come up and 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 supplant Swift next year. And and just in terms of the goaltending. Just stay tuned on that front. Like, I, I mean, if I'm if I'm looking at, like, here's the thing. I don't think there's a blockbuster deal for a forward. Like, you're not moving a, the first-round pick for a forward unless there's a guy that's good that's got term left, okay? And then maybe you have to move some money out. Um, defensively, I think they have enough internal options. They don't need to address that. So, I've already mentioned, like, if you want to improve the third and fourth line, I think there's players like that available for a low acquisition cost you know, a fourth or fifth round pick. Now, mm-hmm. and, and one more top six forward that you know that you can count on that's got term left in his deal or a goaltender, you might be talking a first round pick and a, a prospect plus plus, right, to make that happen. I think maybe that's, that's a possibility, to be completely honest with you. But it is also feasible, Robin, that it could be Smith and, Sk- and Skinner next year at the start of the year. It's, that is a feasible... I don't know if it's Skinner starting 50 games, though. I think it's Smith that would start 50 in that scenario. Why does Jake DeBrusque's name keep coming up? I, I, I mean, here's a guy who's, this is it for his contract, right? So he's going to be an yeah. RFA. He would be kind of risky to take on unless the deal was right. But the name just keeps coming up. And I know he's been struggling a little bit in Boston, but are you surprised that we keep hearing the Edmonton connection other than the fact that Louis up in the broadcast booth? I mean, I, I'm trying to figure it out. I think there's more there than Boston's gotten out of them the last couple of years. Yeah. But to me, what makes sense for Jake DeBrusque is 
If he doesn't get qualified, pick up the phone, call Rick Vallette and say, how would Jake like to come into Edmonton on a two-year deal or a prove-it deal and play in our top six every night? Yeah. And then shift Hyman over the right side. Zach Hyman, by the way, guys, has been the most impactful free oh. oh. agent acquisition that they've had. Robin, dating back to when you were, or the, the biggest acquisition by a trader free agency. Yeah. Since the year Chris Pronger got brought in. Like he's just, he's, you know, I, the, the team Canada brass is meeting as we speak. I would suggest to you he's right there. He's right in the mix to make that team sort of in the 11 through 17 spot in the, amongst the forward groups, you know? Um, so that, and some might say he's better on the left side. I, I don't know about that, but he is a right shot. Usually forwards can play both wing positions. So they've got Paul Yarby, who's a very intriguing long-term uh, player that the fans absolutely love. So if, if DeBrus, let's just say hypothetically, like logic dictates the Bruins are going to try to get something for him. Right. So they're going to try to trade him, and the team that tries to trade him, trade for him, is probably going to try to negotiate down on an extension. Yeah. But if it completely falls apart on Boston and they're, they can't move him by the end of the year, and they can't, you know, and Bruce Cassidy is back there as the head coach because it appears as though Jake's a bit of a whipping boy in Boston. Then I'd have all the time in the world to see if I can convince Jake to come in here, right? I mean, if that, ulti- you know, if that comes to fruition. I just, I think from an asset management perspective, Boston's going to come up with a solution quicker than that. Okay. And uh, I know that you're tight for time. Let me just throw this at you. At three sizable games coming up this week. Minnesota's playing very, very well. We know that. That's the Tuesday game. Then the Boston Bruins are in town. Hmm, interesting, the timing. Uh, Boston's here on Thursday. And then it's Carolina on Saturday. How's Connor McDavid going to react this week? After the uh, the check from behind last week, and I don't, think, I don't know if the league's going to take another look at it. They may, they may not. But uh, I would have to think the captain's going to be pretty charged up for three sizable games this week, Bob. Well, Minnesota is deep and they can score. Yeah. Like that's the team and, and they've got, uh, you know, they've got, we haven't seen a lot of Minnesota forever. Right. So they got uh, Felino Eck and Greenway playing on that one line. They're huge. It's a massive line. It's really physical. They got a guy named Brandon Duhame, who is a really antagonistic quick four that gets in the gorilla guys. Um, you know, they got two good goals. That's a good team. They yeah. built a good team and Clearly, Dean Evison has been the right coach. Like, to be honest with you, they're in a way better place than I thought they were going to be a couple of years ago in Minnesota. So that's a tough game. Boston, I, I they've, they've got a little bit of injury. What, you know, we'll see on McAvoy because he missed the last, you know, you know, that's, I mean, that's their best defenseman. I don't think Boston's is, I mean, they clearly missed Dave, David Krejci. Neither Taylor Hall or Jake are off to a great start offensively. They don't have a, they don't have a set, like, Charlie Coyle's probably a third-line center, but Boston's always a tough team to beat. Carolina's super deep as well, but they've been taking on a little bit of water here of late. Um, so, and the orders so far this year probably played better against the better teams than they played against the weaker teams. But I, I'm with you. We'll see how Connor reacts. Uh, it's not often that Connor and Leon get held off the scoreboard two games in a row. You know, they got held off the scoreboard. A lot. That was a clinic by L.A. last night. We'll see how Edmonton responds. It's funny, Brittany, you bring that up. And Bob, uh, I said after two periods last night, I think uh, on Twitter along the lines of, I think Connor Connor might go off here because he threw some crap in the first couple of periods. And sometimes that, that gets him engaged if he's not engaged. Well, somebody gave me the, well, that tweet didn't age well after he took the, you know what? I think in these next home games, I think we can see more of the same. I mean, you know better than anybody, Bob. When he's he's got to fight through this stuff, if you frustrate him, he doesn't shut down. He opens up. He says, I'll show you. And more often than not, he does. I think he could have a really good homestand here. Yeah, we're wild. wild. They're playing good teams. And he's going to need what the, what we need to see is we need to see more top to bottom with the yeah. lineup. Like that's, you know, I, I know that's going to be a part of the theme of today's show is, is I know how bad the numbers are in terms of they've, precipitously dropped here in terms of the, the, the support they've got from the third and fourth, like they miss Archibald. That's the guy they miss that brings some energy and moves up and down. And 
Uh, I mean, that's a whole other proverbial kettle of fish with what's gone on in his life. And, um, but they miss that guy, you know, and I just want the guy healthy and be able to live a good life. But he was an, he was an important player for them. He was probably their best bottom six forward. Cassian is, I mean, I, I see the Twitter stuff too. You know, there's a lot of exasperation with the fan base there. So, you know, Connor and Leon are special players that can win a game for you at any time. But hockey is a game where the best forwards play 22 minutes. You got to have some other guys stepping up and making stuff happen in the other minutes. So mm-hmm. we'll have to wait and see here what happens. Bob, how can people track you down? How can they hear you? Uh, we are on uh, 630 Chad. The show's called Oilers Now. It's noon to two. Uh, apparently they podcast it as well. And oh, you're doing okay in that department. Numbers on that show for course. <laughs> they, they know. <laughs> so uh, that's good. Um, I'm glad somebody, uh, Brendan Escott, who's a big part of the show, knows how to do that podcast and stuff because uh, I, I, I missed that session that day. Um, <laughs> love working with Cam and Jack. Two different play-by-play guys, two different styles on the Oilers Radio Network, and I am on Twitter at Bob underscore Stoffer. It's mostly just Oilers stuff. Uh, this is a perfect, to use a Gene Principe line, this is a perfect stocking Stoffer that we've done today before Christmas. Oh, oh Jesus. All right, fine. I just I thought I'd throw it out there. Uh, to you and your family, uh, happy holidays, okay? Well, to uh, two of my favorite guys that I'm uh, doing an interview with at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. Happy holidays to uh, Rob and Brent. Thanks for all your help over the years, guys. The Outsiders is brought to you by the McIntosh Group at REMAX River City. So here we are. We're inching a little bit closer to Christmas. And you would think that in the Metro Edmonton market, things would be slowing down a little bit on the real estate front. But it's surprisingly very steady right now, which is great. Brent McIntosh is just back from his European junket where he was representing Canada along with other REMAX agents from across Canada. They were over in Europe having some fun, but Brent's back now and he's quite pleased with the way things are moving along. In fact, he just sold a home for a really good friend of mine, Chris, just recently. Took about 30 days to to, uh, sell and then Chris went on and bought another home in in the market. So there is definitely something going on and it is a positive. But if you are looking to sell your current home and maybe buy something new, then make sure you give them a call at 780-464-0075, or you can check them out online at macintoshgroup.ca. They'll start you off with a complimentary evaluation of your current home. There's no obligation at all, and certainly no deadline for this offer, but don't let the market pass you by. So both buyers and sellers are more than welcome to call the Macintosh Group at REMAX River City. You can do it directly. Once again, the phone number, 780-464-0075, or you can find them at macintoshgroup.ca and tell them the outsider sent you. So we go from Bob Stoffer talking Oilers hockey to uh, maybe about three hours and 20 minutes west of the city of Edmonton. And we start to think a little bit about skiing because the season is underway at Marmot Basin. And one of the vice presidents joins us. Brian Road, how you doing? I am doing great, guys. Couldn't be better. Fantastic to have you with us. And yeah, you open up on the 18th of November, but you've had a ton of snow between now and then, huh? Yeah, that's right. We opened up with just, you know, a handful of runs as we often do in the lower part of the mountain and people can get out, get their ski legs underneath them. And then it's been funny the last half a dozen years or so, or even more, we get open. And then a few days later, all of a sudden we get a whole bunch of snow. And that's exactly what happened uh, this year as well, especially about a week ago. We just got hammered with a, with a big snowfall over about a three day period. Now, Brian, is any of that to do with, uh, I, if there is a positive side, I don't even know if I want to term it as that, but with all these weather streams that have come barreling into BC and have impacted their weather so much with precipitation, et cetera, has that had any impact on what you're seeing on the mountain? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's where we got all that snow. So that weather, all that uh, wet weather, it comes over top the you know the west side of the Rockies onto the east side where we are. Falls at a higher elevation, obviously falling at a colder temperature. So we get the snow and not the rain. And it snowed uh, about um, call it sixty centimeters over just a couple three days here at the ski area. 
and even more than that up at the higher elevations closer to 80 centimeters so that set us up for uh what'll be just another fantastic season we got a ton of snow out of that Dan Brian, we've known each other for I don't know how many years. How many years have you been at Marmot Basin? <laughs> and I think we did this last year. How many years? You know, I was okay to answer that after 25, 30, even 35 years. But now that it's 44 years, I've become a little more hesitant to answer that question. Yeah, 44 seasons here at Marmot. See, here's the, the weird part. I don't understand how a guy can work at a, at, at a wonderful ski resort like your place for 44 years and you're only 35. Yeah, I ask myself the same, but yeah, you know, the mountain air keeps keeps me young. I think that's it. I look out my window every once in a once in a decade I, and say, "Geez, I wonder if the grass is greener on the other side." But it isn't. Well, before we start talking about all the exciting things that are are coming ahead here, I, I want to ask: When you started there, what were you doing that first first couple of years when you started at Marmot? Like, how did you get rolling? Right. Well. I was obviously a, a passionate skier, uh, even as a teenager. I actually didn't discover skiing until I was 13 years old. That's the first time I put skis on my feet. So that's, you know, that's that's uh, a little bit later than some of the kids, but I, I cottoned on to it very quickly. So I came here originally in 1978 to teach skiing, and that's where my background is. A ski instructor, did that for a couple of years, got my highest level of certification, ran the ski school for about four years, and then migrated into marketing and the rest is history <laughs> for that's i tell you bren that is a long i'm thinking back to the dates brian just gave and i thought holy crap man i was i was still skiing then and i have not been on the skis for literally that long i went i half killed myself on a run uh called jimmy's joker and I don't know if, if you've heard of that run. And I thought that's enough because the doctor said, if you do that to your knee again, you're going to need reconstruction. And I thought message received, but man, that's 40 plus years ago. That's a long time to be doing anything, Brian. Holy cow. Yeah, I suppose so. But you know, it just doesn't get old. And you know, Robin, things have changed a lot in skiing as well. The, the evolution of ski equipment uh, the boots, the skis, the shape on the skis. You know, the ski manufacturers learned a lot from snowboard design. And so they started to design skis a little bit differently. They're a little wider at the tip, a little wider at the tail, more narrow in the, in, the, in the middle. And learning how to ski now is so much different than it was, you know, even 20 years ago. Whole, it's funny you mentioned skis. I was so proud. I I bought a brand new pair. Uh, they were made by Head. They were good skis. Uh, they were Head Keeleys after Jean Claude Keeley, the skier. And they were. Fa I had more ski. I had I had better quality of ski than I had ski game actually. And I we were at Whistler, and I went down this killer expert run, like I said. And I I spent more time barrel rolling down it than I did on my actual skis. And that was literally it. I'd, ha I'd, I'd had enough, but man, I tell you, things have changed now. And I wish, like you mentioned, I wish there was more ski boarding uh, when I was a kid, because that looks like a heck of a lot of fun, uh, especially if you're a teenager. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, snowboarding, you know, just took off when it first yeah. came, it first um, made its arrival on the scene. It's kind of flattened out a little bit now. I mean, like everything, they plateau. But uh, whether you're skiing, snowboarding, when you're sliding down the side of a mountain with slippery things on your feet, that's kind of a fun, fun experience. A, a lot of people don't understand that if they haven't done it. But I, I got to tell you, people who have never, ever skied before and they come up here and they say, OK, I'm going to give it a try. They take a lesson. There's a lot of trepidation for a lot of people around that. And an hour later in a lesson, invariably, yeah. you hear people going, Oh my God, that was so much easier than I thought. Why didn't I do this earlier? And and then we got them hooked. Well, and it's funny you talked about starting late. I started at sixteen, and my buddies at high school took me out to one of the local hills here. Said we're going to teach you how to snow plow, and the next weekend it's up to Marmot in Jasper. We go. It's amazing how learning how to snow plow and then getting the opportunity to hit uh, hit the slopes at Marmot Basin where you've got this long, long run to slowly develop a snowplow into actually parallel skiing. 
uh, you can start at pretty much any age. You shouldn't use that too much as a, as a determining factor on wanting to get into the sport. It's great. Oh, yeah. We, we've got people in their 60s, 70s coming out here trying skiing for the very first time. And, you know, when I talk about the equipment back in the old days, uh, Bren, you know, when you were 16, the way you measured the length of the ski to say, is this the right length to me? You would put your arm up above your head straight up and the tip of the skis would come to your wrist. So, you know, they're a couple of feet above your head. Now they're coming up to your, your eyes. So the design of the ski itself, now mind you, this is, this is going back even 20 years now, they're making the change of the skis. They're so much shorter and easier to maneuver on the slopes because of how they've designed them. They're not just making them shorter. As I mentioned, wider at the tip, wider at the tail, more narrow in the middle. You tip them on their side and, I mean, they don't do all the work for you, but it is a lot easier than it used to be with those long, straight skis. Brian, how, how about the demographics of both snowboarding and skiing? Is there sort of uh, plenty of, of uh, uh, children and young kids and, and teenagers coming into the sport at the bottom end? Like, how, how is skiing aging that way? Yeah, you know, I think I think what I'm seeing is uh, you're certainly getting more young kids starting skiing earlier. I think parents, uh, I mean, it's the one sport that you can do with your family and your kids, even when they're teenagers. Um, they're still happy to spend time with their mom and dad as teenagers if mom and dad are taking them skiing. Yeah. And it's something that the whole family can do together. We see a lot of multi-generational families here as well. Grandpa and grandma are here with their kids and they've got the grandkids here and they're all skiing together. And I think there's, you know, we see more and more families rediscovering skiing. Uh, you know, the kids are you know, two, three years old. And then once they get to be about, you know, even lots of parents are starting their kids at four years old and they're coming out to the slopes, putting them in a lesson. And uh, in a few days, they're all skiing together. So the demographics is changing. It used to be something that, uh, you know, not everybody wanted to get into early because the grooming has changed as well. It's not just the equipment, but how we're preparing the slopes. So we've got a lot of novice and intermediate runs, you know, all ski areas do that are really nicely groomed. Uh, whereas that wasn't the case you know, decades ago. You were the attitude decades ago was you just get me up the uh, up the mountain on the chairlift and I'll take care of myself. But now everything has evolved so much that uh, a lot more people can get into it and at a younger age. Brian, you talked about how skis have improved. I, I was used to the biggest issue for me wasn't the skis and I love skiing. It was my boots were a problem. I just was never ever I, I struggled to find a comfortable pair of boots. But uh, I guess the question is, how much has that changed even in the last five to 10 years? Yeah, maybe not so much in the last five years or even 10 years. It, it has. Every year it gets better and better. But if you go back a little bit further, yeah, the boot technology. Uh, I know that I used to, uh, you know, ski and take my boots off at the end of the day because I'd ski all day long. And I won't mention the brand because they're an excellent brand, but they've got a reputation. And my, my long johns were actually stuck to my shins. <laughs> because I would pe peel some skin off and I'd have some blood there yeah. and I, I get past that. Now it's completely different. I mean, the boots you are so comfortable. They've got these, um, you know, the uh, vacuum fit, if you want to go to that extent, but the, the best thing about, or the thing you need to do when you're shopping for boots is try on a number of pairs because one pair that's comfortable for one person is uncomfortable for another. So you just find the right fit like you do with any shoe, but the boots have come a long way. That's for sure. I've, I've got to ask. Um, I remember lace up leather boots with <laughs> cable bindings. Yikes. Um, do either of those still exist today, Brian? <laughs> No, absolutely not. Well, leather boots exist, but they're in museums and that kind of thing. And some <laughs> people, have, you know, there's some at the Astoria Bar here that you know in Jasper, just sitting on a shelf because of that memorabilia. But no, nobody ski. I skied on leather lace up boots, and I skied on the, uh, you know, the. Uh, I didn't get the the thongs, but uh, you know, you have the safety strap, so when your skis came off. Um, you wouldn't necessarily break your leg because the ski isn't attached anymore. The binding would release, 
but you'd have a strap around your ankle. So that ski could, you know, windmill around and conk you in the head. All of that is gone now. So Nice. Okay, let's talk about some real, real positive stuff. And that is the fact that season's underway. We're getting close to the holidays. What do you guys got planned for the holidays? Anything special over that, that, that time of year when you're, you're going to see a ton of families? I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, most of what you, you refer to as the special stuff, that happens down in town. People come up for Christmas. When they get on the ski hill, all they want to do is ski. That's what they're here for. Yep. Ski, ski, ski. So not a lot. You know, Santa's going to be here, of course, on Christmas. He never misses Marmot based on Christmas. But the hotels in town have a lot going on. So regardless of where, you, where one might be staying in Jasper, um, the hotels always have something special. So this is where you're going to find some of the different events. I know out at Jasper Park Lodge, uh, even if you're not staying at Jasper Park Lodge, just a drive out there and look at the literally tens of thousands of lights that they have. Another thing that people really enjoy doing after the ski day here in Jasper is they'll go skating. And that's a really popular, not just, at, you know, Christmas, but during the, the whole season. So out at Jasper Park Lodge at uh, Lac Beauvert and then up at Pyramid Lake, both, they have beautiful rinks and big loops that go all the way around the lake. And so that's that's very popular for people during Christmas. But, yeah, lots going on in town during Christmas. The best thing to do is just, uh, you know, go online and check with the different hotels as to what they have happening during the holiday season. Now, You've got the killer base going with the the sixty centimeters uh, that uh, dropped in lately. Uh, how about the property itself, Brian? Have you have you tweaked anything? Have you added anything? Have you taken away anything? Um, well, I mean, other than all the new ski lifts we put in over the past say ten years or so, that that was the big infrastructure change. The thing that we really focused on a lot and invested a lot of money this summer was uh, an RFID system and a new e-commerce system. And what this has done is um, this really, really adds to the overall customer experience part of the equation as opposed to the infrastructure. So here's what one can do now uh, that makes it so much easier to get on the slopes. You go online, you buy a lift ticket, you create your profile like you do on any online purchase and then when you come to marmot basin you can go to one of our ticket pickup boxes and it'll spit that ticket out for you it's a card a, a chip enabled card then uh after that you can load that card from the comfort of your own home with a lift ticket and go straight to the lifts so you're never coming to a ticket window again you're parking you're going straight down to lifts you go through the rfid gate you've seen them at hockey games they bip your card let you through the gate and away you go so this is making it way more convenient for people to come skiing and uh, direct access to the slopes is uh, something that people and you know we've got this wonderful parking system here too we've got four parking lots that are tiered up the side of the mountain so people can easily ski to and from their car whenever they want so a lot of people are kind of camping out they might come back and you know tailgating i'll call it tailgating they have a little lunch at their own um, their own vehicle and then they go right back to the slope so people who just want to ski all day and do their own lunch and never have to come to a ticket window have that option how long did it take to come up with that idea? Because that's fantastic. I, I, it's a, it's a great customer service as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know, the RFID technology has been around for a long time. You, as I mentioned, you see it at hockey arenas and those sorts of things, and it's been prevalent in Europe for a number of years, a long time. Not so much in Canada. There are some areas, certainly Whistler Black Home is some uh, wind sport down in Calgary has an RFID system. Um, we're the first mountain area in Al Alberta to adopt this system, and. Uh, you know, so it's it's not new to us. It's just uh, it's a it's a big commitment, both financially and also uh, to to implement all of the infrastructure. So we got on it really early this year. Worked all summer, and uh, it's working. It's just working great. A year ago, we talked about this because COVID was still relatively new, but yet it's still around in its different forms. How much is that? How much has changed from last year at this time to this year? Have you got it down to an art or are you always recognizing that you've got to change to be ahead of the game? 
Yeah, I, I would say that we, you know, everybody, our staff did a fantastic job last year. We learned a lot and it worked very, very well for us. Certainly, we've made some more tweaks this year to that as, you know, the learnings that we took from last year. And, you know, going back to the parking lot uh, comment that I made, that's what makes it very easy for people to ski at Marmot Basin and have real minimal contact. When you're outside in the fresh air, of course, the uh, the risk of transmission is, is almost nil. Uh, but coming back to the RFID, one change is last year, every time you're going through the, t- the maze to get onto the lift, you'd get your lift ticket scanned by a human. Yeah. But that's all eliminated now. You're just going straight to the gate and the, uh, the gate is scanning your card. So that would be a big tweak. One last contact with, uh, you know, close contact with another, another person. And it's all downhill from here. Oh. <laughs> it is. And, uh, you were waiting for that one. I'm I sure. was. I, I For some reason, I have the Gene Principe disease today. I'll have to phone Gino and tell him, I don't know, there's something in the air. I guess I haven't been wearing my mask around Gene. But, uh, hey, listen, this is fabulous. Hey, before we go, Jasper in January is also a big highlight for a lot of Edmontonians and a lot of people in the province of Alberta. What's happening there? Anything you can tell us right now? Well, there's all kinds of things I could tell you if I could remember them all, because uh, there's a lot of events going on, again, down in the community. And this is what we're trying to do. We're going to sell lift tickets at a discounted rate when people buy them online. Right. Always good to visit our website, buy them in advance online. That's when you're going to save. And again, our experience is people come to the mountains, the skiers come to the mountain, they want to ski during the day. With Jasper in January, we have all kinds of events happening in the community in the evening. But for people who are non-skiers, there's things happening out at Moline Canyon, out at Jasper Park Lodge, up at Pyramid Lake. So these are some of the things that you would find that are special events um, and activities happening during the day for the non-skiers. And there are a lot of families where maybe two people in the family ski and two people don't. Uh, so everybody can come and enjoy it. And that's uh, running from the middle to the end of January. So over the course of three weekends, the best thing to do is to go to, to look at all those different events, go to jasper.travel. And Perfect. that's the website. Yeah. How do people get a hold of you? Tell everybody your website skimarmot.com it's a great one hey thanks maybe we'll see you in january appreciate your time today this is fantastic as always hope so thanks fellas appreciate it so there we go bob Stoffer joining us to talk a little oilers hockey and brian road from marmot basin talking a little skiing and they're excited obviously by the big dump of snow they've had this past week and good for them okay let's get to a few topics that we haven't touched on First and mm-hmm. foremost, the Vancouver Canucks went and done it. Travis Green is out. Bruce Boudreau is in. Is that going to make any difference to you, Robin? Do you think that's going to change a damn thing? You know what, Brenna? I, I honestly can't say, and I know that's a real boring answer, but he, the thing that jumps out at me is this, and I was thinking about it because we also had an Elaine Vigneault uh, swap in the NHL today as well, but I was thinking – I'm so sick of these retread uh, coaches, uh, the recycle bin. Uh, I mean, Bruce Boudreaux has a terrific record, but he's 66 years old. Um, And then I thought, why don't, why does a young guy like Travis green get bumped uh, with a team that to me has some flaws in it. And then I look up Travis green having covered him in the Western Hockey League as a player in the NHL. And I go, holy crap, man. Travis Green is 50 years old. I know. It's amazing. You're Um, right. These guys that we know from the dub days, and I'm thinking, I mean, this is a bit of a tangent here, but how many, I I wonder how many, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up today. How many head coaches in the National Hockey League are under 45 years old? There's not, there's not that many. This is still a, tried and true uh, guys been around forever uh, league. And that's why we've got uh, Bruce Boudreaux going behind the bench in Vancouver. And unless he can make what looks to me like a substandard lineup uh, be better. I don't know that they get a whole lot better. Actually. Do they wait too long to make this, this move? Cause we've been seeing this come for a month. Things yeah. just weren't going They're They're now out of it. I can't see them getting back into this thing. 
I just, uh, I'm, I'm just shocked that they waited until the month of December to make this move when they probably should have done it back in in early November. It also makes me wonder, and I know the moment I say we start talking about Benning as the general manager, you know we're going to wrap this podcast up and find out that he's out, right? But it just seemed to me like this. I've seen glaciers move quicker than this, Robin. Well, yeah, I mean that's, you know what they just haven't performed, and 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 uh, you know, Benning. Benny and his out. Have they not made that announcement yet? I don't know. Have I have I missed that? I didn't see that at all. They haven't even well, technically made the Bruce Boudreaux announcement, but we're hearing it from everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Well, I I can look again, but I tell you what, that team is flawed. And the other thing is, they have, uh, uh, like you said, waited too long. And the key guys, uh, be it Elias Pettersson. Uh, Besser and those guys have not been as good as they need to be for this team to be successful. Once you get past that good young core, there's not a lot there. And uh, if the good young core isn't producing, you're in a world of trouble. Goaltending has been pretty solid. I've watched a lot of Canuck games actually this year, and uh, Thatcher Demko for me has been sensational. But it just, him, yeah. it just it just has not been enough. And then the Flyers relieving head coach Elaine Vigneault and assistant coach Michel Therrien. They're out. Yes. Oh, is there a position open anywhere where maybe these guys might be interested in going to some place where a francophone might be welcome? Hard to say. But uh, Mike Yo is going to be serving as the interim head coach with the Philadelphia Flyers. So that's the move with AV. And uh, then let's also focus on uh, not only that, but let's take a look at what else is going around the National Hockey League. The the, uh, the thing that I'm really – the Calgary Flames are playing great. We're going to get somebody on from Calgary – for next week's podcast because they mm-hmm. don't show any signs of letting up. Daryl Sutter's got them playing beautiful hockey. It's not beautiful hockey. Let me rephrase it. It's beautifully structured hockey. They yeah. just seem to play the same style every night, and they get a great effort out of everybody every night, and their goaltending is solid. You and I had talked during the week, and when I take a look at the Edmonton Oilers, are they a playoff team? That They do check that box for me. Can they win in the playoffs? I don't I don't know. Right now, I just don't know if the Oilers can get it done because playoff hockey requires more than superstars and power plays. And as Bob Stoffer alluded to earlier, the bottom six all of a sudden has gone cold, and that seems to be part of the reason why the Oilers are struggling, plus some injury uh, situations. But the Calgary Flames, are they a playoff team? Absolutely check that box. Can they win in the playoffs? I don't think that there's any reason why that box can't be checked there either, Robin. No, you know, we we touched on this uh, several weeks ago, Bryn. The Calgary Flames are playing the kind of hockey uh, I thought Sutter might have them playing uh, last year when he came in yeah. for Jeff Ward. And it takes time, even if, you know, even with that kind of track record, uh, the buy-in oh, and the personnel has to be right. We know there's changes there. The, the team substantial. When you take out a, a, a Mark Giordano out of a lineup, uh, and he's a good hockey player, he wasn't the, a problem, but that substantially changes everything on the back end, bottom line. Uh, they are playing the kind of hockey Sutter wants them to play, and they look very good right now. Bouncing back to the Oilers, I'll say I'll say this without making excuses for what we've seen. I don't think we should be judging the Oilers uh, when they were nine and one, saying, "Well, look, man, these guys are unbeatable. Got to be Stanley Cup favorites, right?" No, wrong. Um, you can't put too much weight in that in that first ten games. You can bury yourself in the first ten games. Oh yeah. But you can't win anything in the first 10 games. And now it's the flip side. And as Bob mentioned, you know, the overall record's fine. But now we can't look at this team without its whole left side on D. Now Nurse is back. I get that. But uh, that's substantial. Uh, You Take away the first three left defensemen on any team, you're going to get a a hiccup. That doesn't mean it's the reason for all the troubles they've had lately. But get everybody back healthy. Uh, see the team play together uh, as a group. And then I think you can better decide on everything from the forward depth, which has been a problem, what the defense looks like. Somebody said, well, we've seen enough of Duncan Keith to know what he does and doesn't bring. Well, not with this group. Duncan Keith has played 18 games. You can't 
go well in Chicago. In Chicago does not matter. Uh, and he came in late uh, to training camp because of the vaccination deal with him. So, I, I mean, I, we know what he is, but let's see what he and CC can do when they've had more time. 18 games to me isn't telling, doesn't write it in stone. Do we need tweaks back there? Probably they do. Uh, you know, Bob's touched on that, but there's there may be something else going on as well, uh, which Stoffer uh, mentioned. This team is not a finished product, but I don't think we need to decide who and what the Oilers are by the end of December. There's a little more time left to do that. Yep, plenty of time left. Uh, hey, before we go very quickly, and we'll talk more about the Flames next week, uh, and I'm guessing we'll talk a fair bit about the Oilers because they have three rather sizable games coming up this week as well. Yeah. CFL playoffs over the weekend, the East and the Western finals. We had Winnipeg winning in the West over the Saskatchewan, the pesky Saskatchewan Rough Riders that you thought were going to get rolled over. I wonder if that's a bit of a wake-up call game for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers because five turnovers in the first half and they still won. Wow. You know what? I, I, I thought Kolaris looked, looked awful. Um, yes. And the one, the one pick he threw, I mean, a rookie quarterback doesn't throw that when he's in the grasp and he's off balance. He had a terrible game. I thought, you know, um, as I said to Rod Peterson leading into the game, I thought they'd essentially slap them around and win by 20. Well, they sort of slapped themselves around <laughs> with all those turnovers and they still won. They're the superior team. Uh, I mean, I don't see anybody beating the Bombers unless they can come up with even more turnovers than what we saw. I like, I didn't pick it. I like that Hamilton win too. That works out just Well, fine. for a lot of reasons. One, I thought yeah. the Canadian Football League handled the whole COVID thing with, uh, oh. with the Toronto Argonauts horribly, but I, I don't want to go down that road any further. The, I, the, to me, the CFL, if you've got something, if you've got this regulation in place, then live and die by it. Yep. Not because it's their uh, their biggest market. You shouldn't be caving in. I thought they caved, but I'm with you. Like the way Hamilton played, and in the first half, I thought it was going to be a Toronto victory, but Hamilton came back beautifully. And now they get to play at home in the Grey Cup game in front of a sold out crowd. So yes. good for them. Winnipeg and Hamilton, though, still got to favor the Bombers, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. We'll uh, we'll also rehash that coming up next week. Hey, uh, before we disappear, uh, we've got to just talk briefly about how you can uh, track us down. On Twitter, the handle's really simple. It is at Outsiders2020. Also, make sure you tell your friends to subscribe or follow us, our RSS feed, on your favorite ear candy sites like Apple, Google, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Deezer, others. If you follow our RSS feed, when we download a new show, it goes immediately right into your Right into your system. It's the best. We're also on YouTube. Robin records, as always, out of his luxurious studio in the southwest part of the city of Edmonton, just mm-hmm. off the Anthony Hende. And I'm downtown Edmonton at the Road 55 Studios, and it's always a lot of fun. And uh, that's pretty much it today, Robin. I guess uh, let's settle in and see what the week brings, okay? Absolutely. There's lots happening. All right. Talk to you later. See you. Storm in the castle.